Nigeria as a federation has three arms of government, the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. Each of the arms have their own roles and responsibilities. The president is the head of the executive arm and is often perceived as the most powerful arm. And although they all have their own powers, the other two arms could be influenced by the powers of the executive. But to discuss how this works and, of course, the importance of separation of powers and ensuring the success of a democracy, we have joining us live Dele Farantimi. He is a legal practitioner. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Good evening. Uh, happy Independence Day. It, it's interesting when we talk about the separation of powers. I mean, I'm sure everyone who went to secondary school did that uh, you know, aspect of government, if we still can remember it. But looking at it in its practicality, how independent is our judiciary and our legislature uh, asides the executive? Well, I guess what qualifies me to speak to you more than anything else is the fact that I'm actually a retired lawyer. Because if I were to be a lawyer, I would have to deal with the issues of diplomatics, and I might not be as forthright as your question desires or deserves. When you speak to the independence of the judiciary, you're presuming a lot of things. Even everything, the totality of your question presumes a lot. It presumes the regularity of a state. It presumes citizens. It presumes power that is anchored on law or to law, it presumes the separation of powers. It presumes the, the judicial being independent. It presumes the independence of the legislative arm as well. But all these are actually presumptions that are not found on any reality within the Nigerian space. What you'll find is that since 1966 up till date, Nigeria has been talk heavy. It's been essentially about the executive harm developing at the expense of the other two. So whilst all through the military interregnum, when you had the succession of military bandits that ruled Nigeria, the one thing that was never left on that was never left um, nobody ever touched it was the executive, the powers of the presidency, the power of the military imperator. So you had a situation where the military could dictate anything. It declared itself to be above the law. So you had a situation where the judiciary could say whatever it cared to say, but its rulings were never really binding on successive military regimes. So it developed as a behemoth the only body that developed without the niceties of a legislative arm were the military junta's. So all this continued until we began this democracy experiment. So what you are seeing is a situation where, though we speak to the separation of powers as though we were to be like every other country, we are in a situation where there really aren't any true independence. So you're saying that this is non-existent, it's not even existent, not a tiny bit of it can be found in let the me, Nigerian state. See, let me give you an example. When General Buhari was tired of the phase of the CJN on Oge, he took extra judicial measures to remove him extra legal measures to remove him from office in order to have his preferred CJN. Let's be clear about that. There was a suspension of the legal order in order for the person in Asuro. This is not about his own person alone. Several other presidents before him have done their own thing. So it is not like the judiciary has been particularly independent of the executive arm of government in Nigeria. It's always been essentially his master's voice, HMV. If you doubt it, check this out. Every time there are issues within the political parties, you're going to find as many as three, four different conflicting judgments of the court that comes out in record time. But when it is about human rights, you find the same judiciary slow walking, and then the case is staying two years in court, and the person is not seeing any judge. 
The other 300 Nigerians in Kirikiri, for instance, arrested since the immediate aftermath of NSAS. None of them has been taken before any judge to be tried. Eleven, this is the 12th month. 12th month. And there is a judiciary. So exactly how independent or effective is that judiciary? So, but it does call to question, you know, the people who make up the judiciary, the bench, the lawyers, every single person, including the NBA and the NBA president. Uh, but we cannot talk about it without talking about how we got this bad. Because what the picture that you're painting me is, of course, of doom and gloom. Because I'm thinking to myself, whatever happened to, or, I mean, where is the hope of the common man? Because the judiciary used to be referred to as the last hope of the common person. But you're referring to those common people as the ones that are languishing right now, and there's nobody to speak up for them. So I'm putting that question to you. What happens to the, the hope of see, the common person? See, um, you said I just painted a picture of doom and gloom. Truth of the matter is that all I just done was show you a mirror. I done nothing like paint any picture. And what I just done is show you maybe a brief glimpse, it's a tease. The reality is that for any Nigerian to expect that there is a sector of our country that has been spared the putrefaction that you see in every other part, the health sector, the security sector, the whatever part of Nigeria you look to, is not me painting any picture. It's me holding up a mirror. All you really need to do is look at the fact that today, within what you call a judicial system, how many Boko Haram or Fulani theorists are awaiting trial? But NSAS protesters, people who are just walking on their own, people who are picked up randomly, I'm saying it on here. Over 300 of them in Kiriki, and this society is quiet, and you're talking about a judicial system. The fact of the matter is that on several levels, our country is, there's is nothing to be happy about. There's nothing to talk about as independence. It's not me painting a picture of doom and gloom. This is me telling us, let's stop pretending to ourselves that everything is fine or that we're in a normal situation where we can speak to high principles of state such as separation of powers, a judicial system, um, a legislative harm, or an, we don't have those things. We just have, we have a Frankenstein that pretends to be a state where you don't have citizenship, where the law does not rule, and where injustice is more likely to be found within the legal system than justice. So when we now speak in terms of these high principles, it would be a purely, purely, it would just be me trying to rehash my government, the, my days in uh, A levels government, the several failed attempts at the jam that forced me to learn government, perhaps better than most students because I needed to pass. Because, but in reality, these are just theories, but they don't apply to us. If we were in a democracy, we would not be having some of the discussions we've been having. But we are in a democracy. We were... are, are we not in a democracy? Oh, please. Oh, please. What, oh, okay. please. What, what system of government is Nigeria operating on, since you do not think that we're a democracy? Let's first of all get something clear. Democracy is essentially about the expression, the capacity to express your right to self-determination. People tend to confuse that with the right to a referendum. Now, it's not about that. The right to self-determination means that the people within a space have the capacity to express their democratic will over and above that of any other entity within the state. The collective will of the people rules. By whatever definition or parameters anyone cares to measure, Nigeria does not qualify to be called a democracy. The will of the people has never found expression. The, what you would call the 1999 constitution, for instance, 
that any constitutional lawyer will call the groom norm of Nigerian state is an imposition of a coterie of military bandits who decided what kind of governance structure they wanted for Nigeria. The last time Nigerians had any say in their own rule, there were only four regions. Today, there are 36. And those 36 states, how many people ever vote? You've never had up to 30 million people vote in any election, and you say you have over 100 and, and million. And whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? I was going to ask you. The ah, reason why we're here, the reason why you're that saying you that nothing, nothing we're referring to actually is real, you're saying that all of these things are window dressing. The fact that we call Nigeria a democracy, the fact that we think that we have separation of powers. But what is the role that we as Nigerians have played to have the system that you have said has deteriorated to almost nothing? All right. Let me, let me say this. Sometimes we, in an attempt to be politically correct, we tend to end up doing what I call victim blaming or victim shaming. I'll tell you this, a lot of young men, some of whom I later met, most of those who were injured in the aftermath of the ANSAS protest, I had occasion to work with some of the victims. So I met some of them, young people, courageous. And um, what I'll say to you is this, Nigerians have tried their best several times to be heard, but those of us who have presumed to offer alternatives, we have failed them by not offering ideas. We've been reacting, reacting to systemic injustices instead of offering alternatives as to the way forward for Nigerians. So it's very easy to turn around and say, what have we done? Or think about it. The collective will of the Nigerian youth are mobilized properly, if I might say, got them together this time last year. They started their movement, and then they formed what became known as the NSAS movement. And these people brought their wills, their wishes, their desires for Nigeria. They brought it to the table. It started with a protest against a section of the Nigerian police, the brutality of the SARS unit. And then it snowballed. What started as NSAT became end bad governance. It became end impunity. It became end swap. It became a byword for we want a new Nigeria. Question is this. Regardless of how many lies the Nigerian state might have told, we've established clearly before the Lekki Tribunal. The response of the Nigerian state was clear and unequivocal. In spite of the fact that multiple weaknesses testified to the peaceful nature of the protests. Multiple witnesses testified to the sponsored violence of the state. And multiple witnesses testified to the fact that men wearing Nigerian army uniforms were active in that place and they were not firing blanks. I will not presume to say what, to determine what the panel will end up coming out with. But one thing is clear, by the amount of denials that have come out of the government, the works of people like Agent Fashola and the rest of them, it's become abundantly clear that the state has something to hide. And it cannot deny the fact that when the Nigerian youth offered alternatives as to how they want to see Nigeria progress and the direction they wish to see it move, the state responded with brutality. So it is not like Nigerians have not offered ideas when they do go to the polls, increasingly, the state has also shown that it's a waste of time going to the poll. It is not, <laughs> look, the number of heads that have been broken in Nigerian electoral violence, the number of people that have been injured for simply speaking their truth in this country, and we're in a democracy. I hate to imagine how many heads might have been broken today in protest. I didn't bother, I, I didn't go out to protest, but I know people have gone out to exercise their God-given right, their right, and what should be a democracy. I don't know how well they fare today, but the fact is, Nigerians have tried. Perhaps those of us who consider ourselves thought leaders need to offer more concrete ideas, and I plead guilty to that, and I said that maybe that is a lacuna we can feel 
But and it would how, be unfair how do we to say that. It? How do we feel it in closing? Because I was going to ask. Um, but we're not trading blames here. We're looking for solutions. And if the, if the judiciary that is supposed to help uh, strengthen the process seems to be a bit toothless, um, how, where do we even start to deal with the issue? How do we feel that lacuna? Because it is obviously a problem. See, I, there, is a, there is a thought that is percolating through my mind and I'm working on it. And what it says to me is that Nigeria is actually um, suffering from what I'll call a multiple identity syndrome or split personality syndrome. But what has happened is that the one of the personality has overshadowed the rest. And it has influenced the trajectory of Nigeria and determined how it has flowed. But those of us who I would say are the unmanifested twin of that of that uh, entity suffering from this disorder, we've lost our voices. We've ignored to offer alternative visions for the future that will be sufficient to ignite the imagination of the Nigerian people so that we might be able to mobilize them behind the vision and behind the ideas. We don't have the money to spend that the politicians have to spend. All we have are ideas, truthful ideas. We must be prepared to take these ideas to the people okay. and let those ideas engage them All right. to take them to a new place. Well, I want to say thank you. Uh, Dele Fato, uh, Faron to me is a legal practitioner. He says uh, he is a retired Hi. lawyer. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Happy Independence. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a quick break. And when we return, our last conversation is on insecurity across the country and how far the fight against it has gone. Stay with us.